I were the leader of the country, I probably wouldn't do anything very much different from anyone else, uh, no matter what I believed. And the reason is I would be under such tight constraints from real objective power that I just wouldn't have any leeway. Uh, there's good reasons for it. But so let me, instead of going into that, I go into that if you like, but instead of doing that, let me answer your first question. What, the, let me take your other way of formulating it. What do I think we ought to do? Uh, uh, well, I think there are some pretty obvious answers, both in the Middle East and in, uh, at least there's a general framework for obvious answers in the Middle East and in Central America. Uh, in the Middle East, there's been a very broad international consensus on a political settlement of the Arab-Israeli conflict, and there has been for many, many years. Uh, that consensus, for example, was expressed in a, uh, 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 a resolution that came to the UN Security Council in January 1976, so that's 13 years ago. Uh, it called for um, a two-state settlement, uh, establishment of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, uh, a settlement on the internationally recognized borders, namely the pre-June 1967 borders, and then it just repeated the wording of UN 242, the main UN document, uh, with uh, guarantees for the independence and territorial integrity and security of every state in the region and its right to live in peace and security within recognized boundaries. And then it went on to discuss some modalities you know, for achieving this end. That's the basic framework of the international consensus. Well, that particular resolution was vetoed by the United States. Uh, Israel refused to attend the session. Uh, the resolution was initiated by the three major Arab states, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt, the three confrontation states. It was supported by the PLO. In fact, it was openly supported by the PLO. According to the Israeli delegate, who's now the president of Israel, it was in fact prepared by the PLO. Notice that that is worth noting this because that means that already 13 years ago, uh, Arafat had gone exactly as far as he did in that famous press conference on December 14th, which was alleged by the media to have changed everything. Nothing changed. He had just repeated the same position he'd been saying for the last 13 years. Um, there's reasons why the United States changed its position, but that's different. Uh, this was, it was supported by the Soviet Union. It was supported by most of Europe. It was supported by most of the non-aligned non countries. In fact, virtually by the entire world. Uh, that's why the United States had to veto it alone. Uh, well, that's... You could argue about details, but something like that is a, probably the only plausible, at least interim, settlement. If you wanted to pursue it seriously, you'd have to talk about economic relations of a federal nature between the two states and all sorts of other things, and modalities to secure it, and so on and so forth. But that general idea has been a very broad international consensus. For years, the United States is alone, virtually, aside from Israel, in opposing it. I mean, not totally alone, like it's posed by Gaddafi. There are rejectionists, aside from the United States. Part, there's marginal groups around the world, like Khomeini, you know, the Afghan rebels. I mean, there's a few other groups that oppose it. But primarily, it's posed by the United States. That's why it doesn't get anywhere. Now, that has disappeared from history on the assumptions of the propaganda model. That's not part of the peace process. Why? Because the United States was opposed to it. And it's a logical impossibility that the United States should be opposed to the peace process. So therefore, that's gone from history. When the, United, when the New York Times, or any scholarly monograph for that matter, reviews the peace process, they don't include this, because this is not part of the peace process. Well, that's only one example. There are many others. Uh, and I think that's a general framework for settlement. Uh, as far as Central America is concerned, I think it's pretty obvious what ought to happen, generally speaking. I mean, the United States has carried out major crimes in Central America, really major crimes. Uh, in the ninth, I mean, first of all, our whole history, look, Central America is one of the most miserable areas of the world, and it's an area where U.S. influence has been enormous for a century. Well, at once that tells you something, you know. I mean, you don't have to think very hard to figure out what that means. Uh, and it's for reasons. There are reasons for it. You look into the details, you can find out reasons for it. Even the so-called constructive programs were actually lethal, like take the Alliance for Progress. You know, mo most of our, of the, a lot of what happened in Central America is just because we impose dictators and gangsters and terrorists and so on if they ever try to get independent, as in Guatemala. But every once in a while there's something called a constructive program. The Alliance for Progress is the famous case. Well, you know, the Alliance for Progress was like a plague probably the worst plague that hit Central America until the Reagan administration. That's killers in a category by themselves. Uh, the Alliance for Progress, first of all, was a completely cynical operation. 
I mean, the Alliance for Progress was not instituted by the Kennedy administration because they suddenly discovered that there are poor people in Central America, and they knew that all along. Uh, it was initiated because they were afraid that the poor people in Central America were going to follow the Cuban model. Now, that means it began as a purely cynical operation, okay? And that showed. Uh, the Alliance for Progress was designed to impose on Latin America altogether, in fact, uh, an agro-export model. They're supposed to shift production from uh, subsistence crops to export for the benefit of U.S. agribusiness in the American market. Well, that has consequences. For example, it means that uh, farmers in Central America are expected not to produce rice and beans for them, to people locally, to eat, but asparagus and uh, broccoli and flowers for yuppie markets in the United States. Well, for one thing, that means they're not going to have anything to eat, so they've got to import food, which they import from us at high costs, which is good for American agriculture, uh, subsidized usually by the American taxpayer, now subsidized by them. Uh, sec and it also means that, and that food is not going to be equally distributed. It's going to be distributed to the rich. Uh, furthermore, the production is going to be by the rich because it takes capital inputs to produce the fancy fruits for the American market. Uh, so there's going to be landless peasants. Uh, furthermore, they're going to produce beef. Uh, in fact, every Latin Amer Central American country, beef production sh moved up rapidly under the Alliance for Progress while beef consumption reduced. And the reason is uh, that ranchers moved in, often with North American connections, drove peasants off their land, uh, um, uh, turned it into grazing lands so they could send beef to North American markets for hamburgers. Great for agri, uh, terrific for American agribusiness and for pesticide and fertilizer manufacturers and for the rich in Central America, but not very good for the people. Now, you take a look at, you look, go to your favorite economics book or Latin American studies book and they'll tell you that the Alliance for Progress created an economic miracle. Well, you know, from a certain point of view, it did. A gross national product went up all through Central America. So did malnutrition. You know. uh, and the reason is obvious. You drive people off the land, up into the hills, uh, and you take over their land, and you produce beef for export and fancy crops. It's good for the gross national product. It just means the people starve. You know. uh, and in fact, the crisis of the 1980s is largely caused by that plague. Well, let's just take the 1980s. During the 1980s, the Reagan administration is responsible for roughly 200,000 people slaughtered. And that doesn't mean just killed. You know, that means tortured and mutilated and raped. I mean, Pol Pot-style torture. That's pretty serious business. Hundreds of thousands, in fact, millions of refugees, large areas of the country destroyed. All of this in an effort to block social reform in all three major countries where we were involved, in Honduras and El Salvador and Nicaragua. Uh, now, that's serious. Uh, what should we do? Well, the first, first thing we should do is stop torturing them. The uh, second thing we should do is pay reparations, because we owe them. Uh, and and uh, after that, maybe there's some hope that they could reconstruct from the damage we've done to them. I think that's what we ought to do. Try to find anybody suggesting that in the mainstream, however. You can't express this view, uh, not because it's false, but because it's true. And if you look into it, you'll find that it's true, I think. Now, how, what should we do? I mean, let's go back. Well, what we should do, I mean, we, we are free to act. Plenty of things that we can do. And for one thing, we can just provide aid ourselves. You don't have to wait for the state to order you to provide aid. They need it badly. I mean, Nicaragua is reeling. The hurricane last October was the final blow. They're going to have mass starvation there. Now, the government, of course, is delighted, the U.S. government. They won't send them a penny because they want them to suffer as much as possible. But American citizens are much more independent. And in fact, they've raised a lot of money. Uh, for example, there's one small Jesuit center in uh, North Carolina or Virginia or somewhere, the Quest for Peace, it's called, the, the Quixote Center. A little, I think they may have three staff members or something. Now, they've raised millions of dollars from people in the United States who are able to think for themselves, who aren't just slaves of power. Uh, and those are things that can be done. You can help people survive. And you can, after all, put pressure on uh, on Congress, on the media, to do something about this. A lot of ways of doing that. Uh, ways, all sorts of ways, ranging from civil disobedience to writing letters to the editor to, you know, a mass popular organization. You know, they're not going to put you in jail for it. 
in that sense, a very free country, which means if you don't do it, you have a lot more responsibility than if you don't do it in a place where you are afraid that you're going to be repressed. So there's no shortage of things to do. It's just a matter of willingness to do them. And the willingness to do them begins with a willingness to recognize reality. That's the hardest part. I think once you recognize reality, you won't have any more questions about what to do, because uh, it's too obvious. Uh, so the first thing to do is to recognize the reality. That takes a little work. Uh, but once you recognize it, I think it's obvious what to do.